Lights, camera, action. You're used to that, right? Cool. Yeah, action. There we go. All right. Or as, or as Clint Eastwood says, uh, okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. You guys, this week on the podcast, we've got none other than the one and only Jeremiah Bitsui. Did I say that right? Bitsui, right? Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, he plays Victor in the very popular series Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Uh, he's also a dad. And he does a lot of other stuff. We're going to hear all about it. So, Jeremiah, thanks for coming on and giving us some of your time. I'm excited to yeah. kind of hear more about, about your story, your life, and and how you got to where you are now. So, uh, give us a little bit of a little bit of the background. How did you end up on breaking? Actually, first, first, hold on. Everyone's going to kill me if I don't do this. Okay. What do you call it when you spill meth into your cake mix? <laughs> what do you call it? <laughs> Baking bad. <laughs> Oh my god! I, <laughs> I had to throw a dad joke in there, man, oh, and a meth man. joke. I cracked them both at the same time. <laughs> I like that. That's All right. funny. <laughs> Let's steal that. Yeah, you should. You should tell that. You have a vlog too. We'll get into all that stuff. The the Breaking okay. Bad vlog. But anyway, so how okay. did you get to become uh, on Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and all that? Uh, so I got into. Um, breaking bad so i was so like the long story the long of it how i started in in acting was um i, I come from like a, a lineage of uh, rodeo folk rodeo family like my dad was a bareback rider my mom was a barrel racer and they were just like crazy about rodeo they go all over the country and um you know my dad before marrying my mom was like this crazy cowboy and he had like a gang of brothers and cousins and they'd all get on the road and hit rodeos and it was crazy stuff like the stories they have are actually pretty amazing and I've, I've played with the idea of writing a screenplay but um you know they'd hit rodeos and end up in saloons and fighting with other cowboys and breaking bones and then still riding more more uh bronx and right and just bulls. like old school wild wild and west so, sort of um, stuff yeah yeah so i was i was i was born into into all that so um <laughs> Uh, but unfortunately, I was kind of like a runt. So, uh, you know, the joke I always tell is that, you know, that my parents, when I came out, I was like allergic to hay, horses, you know. And so I was kind of like the runt of of the family because I, I couldn't participate in all of those uh, fun activities. So um, long story short is I, I ended up um, a, a show ended up coming to our town and we were living in Arizona at the time. And uh, they came to Chinle, Arizona, and they were looking for, um, they were actually looking for horses. And they, people said that they, my family has great horses. They came to basically audition horses. And um, the lead was supposed to be a female, a, a young girl, five-year-old girl. Um, I came dressed as a ninja because all I could do is... <laughs> watch tv i watch tv and movies and I've, you know we had a rent a flick in our town and uh and my favorite films at that time were, were ninja movies so i came suited up as a ninja ready I love you know, that. knowing these guys were from japan knowing where ninjas were from and my mom was like no nah, this you know she was totally embarrassed <laughs> wait how, how old were said, you well, how old were you, you know, we'll have another meeting but you know, next time maybe you'll you know you can show your face and and you know so you know next time they came i i uh, they, they kind of took it like a formal interview and they said hey we can't find a female lead for this role so you know we're willing to change the role to a male and love to interest you know offer you this role so that was kind of it and then you know not very many active uh, opportunities after that until i moved we moved into new mexico um i got a role on a movie called natural born killers that was like my first, uh, like big, that got me into SAG and then, um, you know, hit a few other things and then a movie, I was a big fan of, uh, you know, various directors and Michael Camino who directed Deer Hunter at a young age. Like I got into very like deep and dark films and Michael Camino was right up there for, for Deer Hunter. And, um, and so I, I knew he, who he was and I had a chance to audition for a film he was directing as a lead, also with uh, Woody Harrelson uh, as a lead, so I'd be working with him again. Um, and on the day, he just told me, he's like, hey, hey, kid, you got the role. He's like, you know, 
I don't think of, I've seen a lot of people. I don't, I don't know who else I could pick. He's like, so I'm picking you. And I was like, okay, cool. And, um, so I was already, you know, super happy, you know, already kind of cashing my checks and, <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, you know, weeks went by, weeks went by and this is just the hard side of, of film and TV. Uh, they ended up going with another actor, uh, John Seda, who's also a great actor. Uh, but the, the, um, studio was pushing him and the money executives and, and the producers were pushing him and they got their way. And so they pushed past the director and uh, so I was heartbroken. So the reason yeah. why I tell that part is because I, I vowed I would never even get into to acting again. Um, I now, actually wanted to get in. You, you vowed that you didn't want to get into acting again after that experience? Yeah. So I, I turned 15 years old and I was like, I, I, I didn't want to get in. And, you know, some of the. That's you young, the business, dude. The reason, yeah. You're like yeah, making these no. life decisions. I'm 15. That was the, one of the questions I wanted to ask when you were dressed up like a ninja. How old were you then doing that? Oh, I was five years old. Shut up. Yeah, <laughs> That's so yeah, funny. I, five. I love it. Yeah. And you know, you have kids. You know, yeah. Like parents we have, you know, and I'm surprised my, my daughter, she's uh, two and a half and I'm just amazed by what she knows. Yeah. And, and, the, and like the personality it, she's taking on. amazing seeing that development. Yeah. Yeah. You know? All right, so you're 15, so, you value yeah. never do acting again. You wanted to get into directing. I wanted to go back to being a ninja. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at age, at age 15, I was like, I'm going back to being a ninja. I'm going to, I'm yeah, no, I, I didn't want to be involved in it any longer. So I, I kind of stepped away from it. Um, unfortunately, you know, things were kind of, uh, things were getting rough where I grew up. Uh, I think that same year I lost like, six of like se six of seven best friends that I grew up with. Um, uh, you know, one of my friends from middle school, uh, got like shot in the face. Uh, yeah. you know, there's just like a lot of crazy stuff started happening and I just didn't see the hope in it anymore. And, um, you had all these guys that I, I, around the neighborhood I lived in and, you know, it was like the quick fix. Like there were, there was, there was money to be made quickly and it was hard to turn it down. And so I kind of started going down that path and, and, uh, and, um, and just kind of lost hope from that perspective. And, uh, you know, I ended up getting shot when I was like right before my 18th birthday. And that's kind of when the light bulb went off and I was like, I got to do something, you know, that doesn't include, um, either going to jail or getting shot. So, um, <laughs> cleaned my act and, uh, went to, uh, graduated high school and then moved to LA and decided I wanted to try to get into film directing, you know. Got it. So, so that brings so you. So all that happened before eighteen. Yeah, that's a lot, dude. Like you got shot. Adult. You're, you're playing around. You're doing like, <laughs> which is just funny. The irony because you're like, I don't want to. I don't want to get shot. I don't want to get. I don't want to get in trouble. All this violence, and then here you are playing this character doing exactly that. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. Like I, I pull from a lot of that experience, you know, as, as a young guy and knowing some of those, like I could play a thousand different bad guys just cause I have a Rolodex of guys that I knew, you know, <laughs> so I'm going to pretend to be that guy that I ran into once. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's this so, one guy. So, <laughs> so, uh, so you moved to LA to pursue that. Did you end up doing yeah. anything in that world or did you just, how old are you now? So yeah, good question. So I, um, I was 19 at the time, you know, so, uh, and I, I won't age myself. So this has been many years, many years ago. Uh -huh. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm 39 years old. So yeah, 20 years ago, I moved to LA and, uh, you know, got into programs, uh, got into, uh, wanted to go to UCLA and then, um, ended up uh, into a few film and television independent programs. And that oddly there was like one of uh, one year there was, uh, I got into a really good program and um, uh, they, they had an acting part of, of the directing program, if that makes sense. So all the directors, they wanted to get us out of our shell and give us a shot at, at acting and also working with each other, excuse me, as directors. And so, you know, I kind of, that was the closest thing that I did to acting between 
my last experience, um, which was auditioning for for that role and losing that role. And so I was kind of, it was bittersweet. It was kind of like, all right, I'll do this, but it, your it heart felt, wasn't in it. Yeah. Uh, you're like, whatever. It felt, felt like home uh, to be honest. Really? You know? And yeah, yeah. And actually I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. And, um, and then a few of the directors were like, Hey, do you mind? Like, you know, we're all shooting stuff. Do you mind? I have this role or I have a little thing that I'm shooting. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, I mean, I'm not really, I'm going to also be a director just like you, but I don't mind. And then, um, not too much later, I moved out of LA and, uh, and was thinking it was permanent just because I ran out of money and my first business um, that was supporting me kind of fell on its face. So um, I got a call maybe towards the end of the summer and I had been, you know, went through like a breakup with my first girlfriend, like all this crazy stuff happened, like, you know, lost the dog that I've had for like 10 years. It was like heavy stuff. And um, so I was just camping out on my, on my grandparents' ranch and ended up getting back to my phone. They didn't have any cell connection there. Got back to my phone and found all these calls. And I was just like, all right, I'll get back to them later. Um, my phone was pretty much on the brink of being disconnected. And I kept getting a call from a 323 number, uh, LA area code. And it was one of the directors from that program. And they're like, hey, I'm working on Lords of Dogtown as the director to Catherine Hardwick. Would you like to be, um, would you like to, you know, to come out and audition. And I was like, I'm out here in New Mexico. I was like, I, and they said, well, you know, we'll fly you out. Like we can't. And I'm like, what, what's the role? And they're like, well, it's this gangster role. And I'm like, you're in LA. You can't find, you can't find some gangsters. You can't find some gangsters. And so the, he's like, well, it's, it's kind of, it's a very specific type of thing that she's looking for. And I just thought of you and, you know, either way, we'd be willing to bill you and give you a credit or something. And I was like, okay. So I, I decided to do it and I thought it was a fluke. And then a few weeks later, again, I got another call from a well-established director and he's just like, Hey, you remember, uh, telling me that story about how you got shot and, uh, your mom found your gun on you. She discovered your gun. Not to I was like, yeah, absolutely. He's like, I wanted to see if it's cool if I use it. We're doing this 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 movie and I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. I was like, don't even worry about it. He's like, okay, cool. He's like, well, if you need any credit or compensation, he's like, I, I said, don't even worry. So he's like, well, the other thing is, I wanted to offer you this role. He said because and <laughs> and hopefully you know you're interested in taking it. But um, he's like, I think you could play it well. And uh, and so that was a movie called um, Oh God, A Thousand Roads, and we took it to Sundance. Um, not too many years later, our DP ended up winning, um, an Academy Award for the life of Pi. So that really is what kind of got me in, into the driver's seat of, of acting again. That's cool. And it was just kind of happenstance. Long story short, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really fascinating. So they took your actual life experience, they turned it into a scene, a scene in something, or was it? I guess. Yeah, they turned it into like a whole. They, they actually they took a lot of stuff that I grew up with into, put it into this character, and I got to play the character. Got it. And then that, then turned into. I mean, did you did you do a bunch of stuff between that and then and and Breaking Bad? Oh, okay. So then, yeah. So then I was like, you know what? Um, I, so I, I got in that. And I just kind of got the bug again. And I started auditioning and then, um, yeah, I got into this, this TV series called mini series called, uh, into the West and, uh, it had a, had a good little role there and, but nothing too big. And then I got onto this other project, um, called wildfire a TV show. And I was playing like this 13 year old kid, which is, which is kind of funny because I realized that adults play teens because, um, you know, young adults, because they can still, you know, they can still look young, but you're not having to pay a, a kid like it doesn't know at my age, doing. I was 13. And, you know, back when I first started and the rate was crazy and the hours you, you're limited on hours. Mm -hmm. So that's why adults end up playing those roles. Um, but yeah, it just kind of kept going. And then, uh, and then I got a role on, um, a movie called Flags of Our Fathers, uh, Clint Eastwood, 
I actually read for the lead, um, got pretty far along, and then they they just Clint offered he created a role, and so that was kind of that was like my journey up until that point. I think I did another movie um, with Tobey Maguire, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Natalie Portman. I, I was uh, I was playing a cop, and um, that was with a director I, I really respected, Jim Sheridan. So all of that was kind of just leading up leading to up, me getting yeah. the opportunity. Yeah. Now, did you, okay, and good for you, I man. It's really cool. You've gotten to do some really cool stuff. And uh, so leading up to that, so you get this this audition for this position in Breaking Bad. Did you know what it was at the time? Or was it just like, hey, we got a role. We need a bad guy. Come, come see what this is about. Or did anybody have any idea that it was going to turn out to be as big as it was? No, I mean, actually, so the first time I got the call, uh, and I, I forgot about the call, um, my, the, and it just because it wasn't really like the way that my agent brought it up, she was like, yeah, there's this weird, yeah. she made it sound like it was a cable series. Like if it was like some kids that were on public access, creating a show about Albuquerque and, and meth and all this. And that's the way that she brought it up. So I was kind of like, Oh, okay. So of course I didn't really pay attention. I forgot about it. And then she called me on the day and said, Hey, just checking in. I uh, haven't heard from you. Are you good for your audition today? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah. What, uh, what is it for? <laughs> and she's like, it's that show breaking bad. And she's like, um, it's at the studios. Um, and I started, a, another business in the meantime, just to kind of when things were slow and yeah. I, I got into the club business and I got like into nightclubs? a nightclub promotion. Yeah. So it was kind of a weird and it allowed me to like work at night, promote, um, make some good money and then, you know, have the day open. So I was meeting, had a meeting at a, one of the clubs and then ended up locking myself. So I had to print when I found out that I had this this audition for Breaking Bad. I had to print the sides there at the nightclub um, I because I got locked out of my my loft, which wasn't too far. And then. Um, I got locked out of my car, of course. So the VIP host at the uh, at the club had to give me a ride to the audition. And he was just like, and I didn't even look at it until I was on my way. And he's like, where are we going? I'm like, oh, it's actually at the studios. And then I started thinking, oh, shoot, Ooh, that's like, kind this of a big must deal. actually, this is a legit thing. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I'll, I'll take you. I've always wanted to see the studios. So we got down there and I was reading for um, um, uh, Los Pueblos Hermanos manager, which ended up being a female role um, played by a very talented actress. And so when I went in, you know, didn't pay attention to anyone, beelined right into the audition, made it just in time, um, managed to be off book somehow. And the director, sometimes when you do this stuff, it's really nerve wracking, but they'll just look at you like he, like, I'll just act like this is my iPad. Like he was like looking at me like this and he was just like, oh. and then he just like went back to whatever he was doing on his, his iPad or whatever. Yeah. And then he didn't even look up at me the whole time. And then he just like looked up once at the end and then he just goes, oh, okay, great. Hey, thanks. And I was just like, oh, oh, man, what an asshole. I ended up, that. I'm friends with him now. So, you know, it's funny, but, um, yeah, left like it's nothing and then just thought okay another one you know whatever and then uh the casting director came out and pulled me in and said hey he wants to see you for something else and i was just like he didn't even see what i was doing <laughs> but you know but uh so i went back in and paid attention and it was like all these nefarious dudes like different colors shades and everything like you know big white guys black guys like it was like a football team walking in and I was just like, how did I not real? You know, it's like bouncers from the nightclub, it seemed like. And those were all the guys that were reading for uh, non what was nondescript customer at the time. And so I just did a cold read. And then uh, that next day they called me and they said I got the role. So, uh, yeah. And then when I shot it, shot with Brian, the scene, he was really cool. Everybody was really cool. And I just kind of thought, OK, that's that's great. That was my little bit. I day played on the show and it, at, at that point I got to know what it was about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I thought that was pretty much it. And then they brought me in season three 
and said, Hey, we're, uh, it was actually Aaron Paul came to my trailer and said, Hey, congratulations. They're making you into a reoccurring, uh, character. And, you know, this is, uh, you're playing Victor. So that's cool. That was kind of, yeah. Was and cool. like, that's such an interesting character. Cause Victor doesn't talk. He doesn't say anything like hard. There's like one line every once in a while. So like, you're really just there. You're like the muscles. You're always just like, if you mess, if you fuck around, yeah. shoot you. Like, <laughs> and it's so yeah, funny. It's, so what did I like? So you didn't have to audition for that part, I guess. Right. Cause they already knew they were like, well, no, yeah, this no, is the I guy mean, for this. So that was Victor. They brought, the character was Victor. So the, the first, uh, scene I did, which was in season two, that was a nondescript customer who we didn't know who that person was later becoming Victor. So what happened was, I guess they decided to flesh out, um, the Giancarlo storyline more. And so, and initially I think they were thinking about going in a completely different direction and then it just became, you know, uh, yeah. But like the first, my first lines that I read were for Mandela. And so it was like 38 pounds, $1.2 million truck stop, 10 miles out of exit 25. And then, um, and that was, that was really it. Yeah. Just delivering information. Hmm. And I really got a lot from that. Just like that. This guy's just no bullshit. And it's all, I'm sorry if no, I don't know if I'm you're good. No, you're good. You're good. I'm good. Um, so, you know, so I just, I just kind of, that that's kind of who Victor is, you know? Yeah. And I just knew people kind of like, like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's like this mysterious dude. I love Victor. I think he's badass. You know, he's kind of like just this, he's like hiding in the shadows, black escalade. He just gets yeah. out and moves around and is like there when he needs to be. And you're like, if Victor's around, something bad's about to go down or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's always this yeah. mysterious, like, Oh shit, it's about to get serious. But then it, it doesn't. Fun. And then times it I does. Never, yeah, I was just going to say, I'd never suspect it would go this long, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it's really cool. So now I got to ask about Better Call Saul. Because okay. Better Call Saul was probably not even a thought before Breaking Bad, right? So Breaking Bad kind of comes to an end. Is that how they, was it season eight? Is that right for Breaking Bad? Was it eight seasons? We went into, it was like technically like five and a half. Okay. It was, um, or six, yeah. I couldn't remember. Some people call it five and a half. Some people call it six. Right. So yeah. then they, they come up with the idea of better call Saul afterwards. And they're like, oh, let's make a pre prequel to Breaking Bad. And let's introduce Saul Goodman and like his backstory. And that's like going on yes. forever now. And you've been a big part of that. Yeah. So yeah, how- it's nuts. Like, I mean, they introduced it as kind of just like his his corny Saul's corny tagline, you know for in, in breaking bad and then it spun off and became a whole different thing yeah i know? mean it's wild <laughs> like cool. the the whole like if you're gonna hire a criminal lawyer you hire a criminal lawyer, criminal lawyer. <laughs> yeah it's so funny it was and he's such uh his character's awesome it's so yeah cool. oh yeah no he's they're, everybody's so cool they're they're great to work with and um yeah man i just can't believe it. it's it's like we're we're still chipping away at it you know it's kind of kind of awesome yeah yeah um well you had a baby a couple years ago we just we said that already yeah. two and a half you said two and a half now two and a half yeah you've been a huge supporter of the company of the brand and of our products so i i personally in the company we all appreciate that and it's really cool to have somebody like you kind of endorsing the product and, and kind of on board with us as a brand and what our message and brand and dna stands for with you know supporting dads and getting dads more involved and things like that um and i'm kind of curious you know talking about parenting you know, you came from this crazy childhood uh, with like these wild, wild west cowboy parents, you know, like how how has that shaped you as a person and or dictated the way that you are being a dad now? You know what I mean? Are you like, uh, I don't want my kids in that environment type of thing? Or you're like, no, that was awesome. And like, that's the life you guys are living is just crazy mayhem or or is it, you know, I'm kind of curious to know some of that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, that's a good question. I, so I think it's really um, uh, what I realized was like I just um, I, I don't think the challenges were were deep enough in terms of like when I was growing up and I was always trying to set my own challenges and set some of these little goals for myself and always starting you know something like I was uh, eventually I would go to the rodeos 
and when I became, uh, you know, like I was on medication and stuff for, for certain allergies and I started to like, um, shine shoes. And so, um, I've always had kind of that entrepreneurial side. Mm -hmm. And so now like with, with my, my baby girl, I, you know, it's just, I'm realizing like she's super smart and we're always having to just challenge her. So I'm thinking of, you know, I start my day with her, just her and I, and, um, I try to think of different activities we can do or things that I can show her. And, um, and then it's not always discouragement. It's, it's, you know, sometimes of course you have to, you have to enforce and that's, that's, that's yeah, important, yeah. you know, to be able to give those boundaries. But sometimes I realize like as a parent, you at that age when they're that young, it's sometimes just, they may get stuck on like, oh, this is how I'm supposed to do this. And I think we all do, you mm -hmm. know, to a certain extent, like yeah. the door opens this way and I'm supposed to go through this door. And it's like, no, baby, you're, it's dangerous on the other side of the door. And for us, logically, you know, we think of it like, you know, we, we have a, we're in a different place. And so I've gotten, try to, got, I've tried to get better at being able to say, no, baby, let's not do that. Let's go over here. Let's go play. You know, forget that. We can, you know, there's dangerous stuff behind that door. Let's go over here. You know, let's uh, come with me. Let's let's build a hut or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and so just realizing that really kind of helps. I, where whereas before, I think maybe I would have been a little more impatient, not understanding. Um, yeah, it's and then I have patience. A patience where, is a big deal, right? When you become a parent, you don't really like. It really will test your patience on many levels, right? Where you have to like, yeah. it's, it's, and if you're not patient enough with certain things, it, you don't give the opportunity for your child to learn something because you end up just doing it for them. Um, yeah. I think I'm struggling with like a good example right now, but um, even just like tying their shoes, you can get to the point where you're like, oh, I'm just going to tie their shoes so we can get out the door. And then yeah. suddenly you learn like your child has never learned to tie their shoes because you always did it for them. You weren't patient enough leaving the house for them to learn yeah. how to and mess it up a bunch of times and know you got to over and under this way or what, you know, this is a weird example, but you get no, the point. It's a good example. You know what I mean? Where you're like, yeah. you got to slow down. You have to change your mindset and just be like, well, we'll get out the door. And we'll, if we're 15 minutes late to the birthday party, we're 15 minutes late, you know, but she'll yep. learn to tie her shoes, <laughs> you know, but yeah. there's, there's yeah. different levels of that. Um, so, but patience is a huge, just such a huge part of parenting that you don't realize you have to be that prepared for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's the, uh, th there's a, a connectivity element to it. You know, they're, they're making major connections and, and, um, and the other thing is not like for her, at, at least I, I feel like I can explain things deeper and she picks up so much. Well, they're like and sponges at that of, age. I mean, like yeah. those first five, six years of their life, they're just sponges soaking up everything they're mimicking everything you do when they start talking they're going to be saying the things that you're saying you know there's a lot yeah. of things that they just and which is why it's so important for parents to be such good role models because they're you're the, you're leading by example and they're watching mm -hmm. that and they're going to mimic that so you know it's so important to to be a good role model especially in those well forever but like those first few years you're like wow they're not really watching oh no they're watching and they're listening so try yeah. to do the right thing yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's cool though. I think like if, I think if, if I would have, um, in, in my own development as an adult, like I think if I would have had a, a kid at a younger age, uh, and who knows, you know, this is all just in theory, Yeah. but, um, I could see that how that could be hard, you know, because I, and it, the funny, there's a funny story. Um, I was on a, I grew up with some kids who actually had had kids back in like middle school. And um, I ran into them at the LAX airport as I was coming back to New Mexico to film Better Call Saul. And I, I was like, you know, happy, excited, you know, all, you know, how you are when you're a brand new dad. And I was telling these these friends like, yeah, you know, I got you know, my first baby coming and their their daughter was already like an adult. So already like literally uh, 21 and That's living crazy. on her own and all that. And so they're laughing at me like, oh, my God. And, so, and you know, I think they had a few drinks at that point so they were, like, <laughs> a kick because here I am, you know, in my late 30s and I'm, I'm finally getting into fatherhood. And and so um you know, I was kind of like just being a good sport about it. 
and then later end up finding out on on uh, social media that uh, they ended up uh, pregnant maybe like a month or two later. No way. Um, so, <laughs> so I I got a kick out of it, and I I know that you know we know each other well, and we can kind of uh, yeah, yeah. We can kind of laugh at laugh at ourselves. That's but funny. um yeah I couldn't imagine being being a young parent. It, 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 it has to be hard. Well, and, you know, and so much has changed. Yeah. So much has changed, you know, even from like when they had kids, you know, who are, who are in their twenties now. Uh, and you said that those people had kids yeah. when they were in middle school. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. They had, they had, um, they had a, a kid in middle school. Yeah. That's wild. But yeah. what, you know what and I was, I mean, we had our high schools, like, I don't have it on me. It, I don't know. It's in storage, but um, I could show you my high school year. I went to like five different high schools, but the high school I ended up graduating at, I had, um, we had in the back of our yearbook, there was like, um, like a kid section. Like we had a nursery, uh, three or four pages. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't even imagine. That's yeah. wild. You've had some experiences. That's how it is up in the hood, man. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but so that kind of goes back, you know, to more of what I wanted to talk about with, you know, with raising your child, like all the trials and tribulations and things that you've been through, the hard times, the getting yeah. shot, the, you know, all these things. Like, has that really that you have a lot of experiences, but I imagine that's really shaping the way that you're trying to to raise your child and to steer her in the right direction and make sure that she's got plenty of like good opportunities and trying to do the right thing instead of kind of going down some of those paths. But it sounds like the area you grew up in was like, that was kind of the path people went and you were able to get, work yourself out of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, for now um, we really, you know, my wife, like her, her, some of her upbringing is completely different. And so the things that she's seen, like she, she lived in Chicago and, um, through high school, she went to a really nice private high school. And, um, and so she knows the value of that. So sometimes I tell her these stories and she's like, that's crazy. She's like, she's like I've never even seen a fist fight in high school. <laughs> I was like, I've been in, I've been in 80 fist fights in high school, you know? And so she was just like, that's nuts. And I tell her some of these stories and she's just like, that's crazy. You know, I got my first gun when I was 14 on the street. Um, and, uh, so it's like a complete different, uh, paradigm, but we both see like, we're, uh, you know, she's a stay at home mom and, you know, has an, uh, a nonprofit on the side, just more of out of her passion. Mm -hmm. But that's really the big thing is we want to stay in the vein of, of being looped into our passions and, um, and, but putting a high priority on 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 the the family and raising raising our daughter and and kids, you know. What was what I know you told me before we started recording, but your wife's nonprofit is what now? It's called the Dream Lab Coffee, and so um, not going with thank thank God she decided uh, not to start her coffee shop pre pandemic, um, and so she was she was testing the waters using it as kind of a, a way to create dialogue um, within the community about, uh, let's say if it was in, inspirational, so if it was me or friends or people in our network sharing what they did within the within their own, um, their their work or their, their journey, their path and their professional career, mm -hmm. and just giving public access to, okay, what is that like? Because we have some really interesting friends um, and I sat on a panel of one and a, a friend was a, um, he was a venture cap guy and, and even people in small business didn't know what venture cap was necessarily. So there was a lot of people that were like, oh, wow, light bulb. That's, that's amazing. And then, you know, it ranged, I think also on the panel, I had my agent, one of my agents, uh, on the panel as well. So, um, it, it ranged from that initially. And the whole, dis the thing was to be able to kind of create round table discussions around coffee because we're really passionate about coffee. And, um, and that was going to segue into the coffee shop pre pandemic. And now that's all kind of changed in a sense that it, now she's really focused on just good works and still discussions matter. And still having those kind of virtual coffees, you know, mm -hmm. but more so um, making impact and doing things in the community. 
Good of goodwill. That's that's super cool. Good for her. Yeah. Um, you talk about guns. That, some of our yeah, yeah. some of our early conversations were about guns. Lots of our like going back. Yeah. I don't know, probably a year and a half ago. I don't even remember how you and I first started talking exactly. I don't remember if I reached out to you or you, me. I, I really don't remember. Do you recall? I don't recall. I think I think maybe I I think I tagged tactical baby gear and because I was given my first piece of tactical baby gear it was um uh the day bag. My uh, my wife got me the day bag and she knew good looking out, she knew that I'd rather rock like something that looked like a, a range bag right than something that looked like uh you know like a pink uh yeah curly uh, diaper, diaper bag. bag yeah for sure <laughs> nothing against that you know some fathers that's you know that's how you roll but yeah. she knew that that's what i'd that's what i'd like have, and yeah. i thought it was the coolest thing you know I um that. with the fold out and everything else and it was uh and i always got a lot of um uh, a lot of uh inquiries about the bag and then um, I think so. I may have tagged you. I, I think, think that's what it was. One of the first. Ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I th- you must have tagged me in something, and I started following you. And then we started having a lot of like messages back and forth. And then I do re- actually was the first picture you posted was that from Los Polos in the chicken. One of one of the pictures. I think it, it was uh, I, I posted on set because it ended up becoming just my day bag, right. you know. And I'd always keep diapers and you know everything handy in there but it ended up just being my regular work bag right like you know my laptop and everything else right 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 yeah it was cool to see it in the restaurant but at any rate so uh going back to the gun things because we went we we've had so many conversations about guns and this pistol and that pistol and you know that stuff so what it what is what are some of your favorite guns um, and I have some other questions too around guns now that I'm talking about it. Okay. So uh, okay. I'm, I recall some of our early conversations being about some of the handguns. Was it HK VP9 that you were looking at? Or- Initially, that's a good memory. Initially, I, I was thinking of um, uh, of getting a, a HK VP9 because a friend had shot his and I really loved it. It's so And then I ended up getting, gun. I was like in that market, you know, and yeah. ended up getting the, the CZ, which was the the p10c which was new at the time and um and so that's kind of my still my like tricked out range range gun I, i've thrown some really uh cool things on it from uh, killer innovations it's pretty much like a killer innovations defcon gun now you know <laughs> nice nice yeah what about uh what about more of the rifle style stuff you're an ar guy yeah i got an um i built my first actually so the Funny, everything I have is like stories, so stop me at any point. Mm-hmm. Um, on Yellowstone, we ended up doing, and there was like, at, at first there wasn't like a real set uh, itinerary or agenda. Uh, when it, when I was on Yellowstone, it was kind of like, hey, we have a gun range, you know, you're going to have some shooting scenes. Um, if you'd like, you know, a production vehicle can take you down there, we can arrange a driver. And so I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. So every day before I shot, I'd go out and shoot. And and it was unlimited. Like literally I could take any gun I wanted out and it was unlimited ammo. And I was like looking around like if it was, <laughs> you know, like if I was doing something wrong. Like, something like, that. like I could take any gun out. So I was like a kid in a candy store for like two, three days. And then I saw these, um, uh, the, um, uh, one of the armors from the show and I figured he was from the show and, uh, you know, he had some crew stuff and everything else. And he was taking pictures and I figured out he must. So I figured I'll go introduce myself. And, um, he's like, Oh my God. He's like, thank God you reached out. He's like, um, let's go outside. Let's go talk. And, and so I went outside and he had his, his friend that was helping him who is actually who's LA uh, LAPD SWAT. And, um, and they were like, Oh, thank God. Like we were just like coming to decide what kind of gun. And we were reaching out to production, hoping we could have a conversation with you. Can, or do you have some time? Can we like, can we, uh, you know, shoot a few guns and see if you, what you feel more comfortable with? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So we shot a few like fully auto blank guns, uh, movie guns, and uh, so they had like an AK-47, like, you know, the kind of like the ghetto blaster AK, you know, uh, no, no stock, nothing. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then yeah. we went over to, 
the fully auto AR and, and then we, we just kind of landed on the, on an AR. Right. And so, um, so reason I tell that is that armor actually helped me build my first AR. Oh, that's cool. We became that's really special. Friends. Yeah. That's really cool. Once you yeah. shoot stuff that's yeah. fully automatic, it kind of ruins you. Like everything you shoot after yeah. that sort of sucks. You know, I remember the first time <laughs> yeah. my brother and I, we went and rented an MP5 one time and we were just like, fun switch, full auto, let it rip. And it was like, that was yeah. awesome. Like everything after that sucks, you know? It'll yeah, ruin you quickly. yeah, absolutely. And I play a lot of characters that, that shoot, uh, shoot guns. Mm -hmm. And um, I was on CSI and I, I kind of, um, in one of the scenes, like I was shooting a, a Mac, I think a Mac 11. And in the scene, I'm fighting with this other character and my gun goes, you know, and right in the scene, in this jostle, like my, my, um, uh, hearing protection fell out and it kind of like still to this day, like I still kind of have like a little ring in my ears oh, just no. from that. Um, and those that shoot yeah, blanks. It was like bouncing off the wall. What was that? Shooting blanks out of those guns. I imagine on set. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sh they were full loads. So it was pretty, pretty loud. Like yeah. we were in an enclosed space. Yeah. I imagine full loads in a full auto gun. Cause it's still got a cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, Ugh. sometimes they'll do half, and and sometimes they can make it work. But yeah, I think they have more jamming issues when they do that. For sure. Yeah. So, uh, what other training have you done? I've 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 seen video or pictures of you at Terran Tactical. Is that right? Yeah, I've trained with Terran. I've um, been down there a few times. I I got into three gun, and um, so I really I really love doing that. Um, and, uh, and so I just try to pick up wherever I can. I train a lot with the LAPD guy from Yellowstone. He en ended up becoming a friend as well. Mm -hmm. And so he teaches me more like urban combat tactical, you know, and he has some crazy stories as well. But, um, you know, the, and then I, I, um, picked a lot of just tricks up about reloads and everything else from, from Taryn. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. I to get out a few times a week i recently i have a daniel defense pdw oh. which is a ton of fun but it's really expensive right now mm -hmm. you know and so i i changed my ar uh the custom one into a 22 and uh you know that way i can kind of get a little more range time yeah I just go plinking around yeah. 22s yeah. are fun, so man. People fun. like knock it like, oh, that's a cute little 22. You're like, you know how fun this thing is? Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's so easy. If you ever want to convert uh, your 5.556 AR, all you do is just yeah. get that. Bolt uh, carrier group in a magazine. The, yeah, you, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, um, yeah. So well, hopefully I, I can take it out this week. Yeah. I may or may not shoot mine 22 converted with a suppressor on it at the house from time to time. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> my kids have done some shooting <laughs> that way. Um, so, uh, the vlog, the Breaking Dad vlog, Breaking Dad, yeah. What uh, what prompted you to do that? Um, I don't know. I think you know, uh, I, I get a lot of messages on on social media and just you know random questions, and I kind of I started with the ideas like. Maybe I should do um, a YouTube channel and just do some Ask Me Anythings or, you know, I've done a few Ask Me Anythings in the past just on Reddit. And I kind of thought maybe it, so it's playing with the floor, the format. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just I thought, you know what, it'd be fun to go and just shoot something, um, maybe take it on the road and once a month shoot something for like a week and just kind of do a, a day in the life of, uh, you know, experience. And, um, so the first one was actually, we, we were going from shot show, uh, to LA for the breaking bad experience and then, uh, up to Sundance for the film festival. So that was kind of, we got a few episodes out of that. Mm -hmm. And then we had some other cool things planned uh, pre-COVID. And then yeah. we kind of got punched in the face by yeah. uh, by COVID. You know, so. I've done a lot of vlog stuff for myself. And like, you go, I go through this mixed bag of emotions around making my own videos. And initially, I, 
it, and it always it goes back and forth. So some of my early thoughts were like, man, I want to document some of the stuff. We're traveling the world. We're going to Hong Kong. We're going to Vietnam. We're going to China. We're doing all these different things. And um, like, it'd be really cool to, to document that and share some of those experiences, but also share some of my knowledge that, you know, around business and e-commerce and, and, and social media and marketing, all this stuff, like share that information with people who are watching and hopefully they can learn something from my experiences and it helps them, you know, be a better person, whether that's like they learned how to do something on their website and now they can make more money. And like, that was because of me or whatever, like those, those types of things that would be really, you know, really cool. Yeah. Um, so I did a bunch of that for a while, for probably a year of just like documenting documentary style vlog stuff. Um, yeah. where it wasn't always me filming people following me around and I just trying to share information or tidbits from meetings or stuff like that. Kind of like Gary V style stuff. Right. And then yeah. that became sort of impractical, uh, to a point where like bandwidth just wasn't there and like trying to edit these videos and get them out. And like, we're trying to run a very rapidly growing company and like trying to really focus on that and not get distracted too much by other things and whatnot. So I kind of like laid off it for a while. And then I was like, no, like I really want to share some information. I want to build an audience outside of this company, uh, for various reasons. Um, I'm not trying to make money off of it. I'm not trying to monetize it. I just want to grow an audience somewhere else. Um, that way, if, if we go out of business one day or if we decide to sell the business one day or whatever, like I still have a voice somewhere outside of the company, mm. you know? So it's like, let me, let me, tr can, let me get back on, you know, try to build yeah. this YouTube channel and try to try to build that up. And, um, then that kind of went kind of South again, where I just didn't have time. And, you know, YouTube's a whole nother beast. Like you can't just throw a video up on YouTube and be like, Oh yeah, everyone's going to see it. Like it's just doesn't yeah. work that way. It's, it's like a full-time job yeah. and it's, uh, it's difficult. You, you don't always get to decide like, Oh, this video has got a great thumbnail and a great title. Like it's going to crush it. Like, no, it's not like you're gonna get 30 views and be like, why am I doing this? And then you get, but you know, it's like those happen, right? Like you, you've experienced it. I'm sure it's like you get those 30 views, but then you get the one text or email or comment on that video. It's like, this helped me so much. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. You know, I can't tell you how much this has helped. Blah, blah, blah. And you're like, all right, right. That's why I'm doing this. It's not for the 30 views. It's to help these people, you know? Yeah. And right now, more than ever, I've got more motivation and more drive to want to do that stuff. I just don't have the time. Yeah. I'm so busy with things going on. And we keep hiring more people here to help do things. But like, it's just making, it's almost making me busier in a way, in, in other ways that are good. But it's just like not allowing me to make those videos that I want to make that like soothe my soul because I know I'm doing something good for other people. It's not yeah. like just trying to make money you know so yeah yeah no i hear you and, and it, it's really just kind of what i think is making a discipline out of it even though i haven't kept it up mm -hmm. um and uh it, but it is it's tough because um you know i mean there's just other pieces of life and then sometimes you find yourself like awkwardly trying to shoot something and then you're like ah this is messed up man. yeah you yeah know, i don't have time or, or then you just forget there's times where i've i've turned the camera on and thought oh this is gonna be this and then i got wrapped up in a call or conference call and then it's just you're like you whatever know, screw this forgot yeah. all about it yeah well, that or you're just not in the right mindset i'm mean, sure for you as yeah. an actor like you have to really be in the right mindset like when we when i shoot a video i have to put myself in a certain mindset to be able to like be creative or, or, or know what I'm going to say I'm on this topic or whatever. And like everything changes when the camera comes out or when the record button gets hit, like yeah. you're, you're like, you either kind of like freeze up. You're like, ah, what was I going to say? Like, no, nah, that sounds dumb. And then you start questioning yourself and you're like, ah, there's, this is going to be stupid. Why am I doing it? Or you're just, something comes up, you get that phone call or that text message. And then it takes you completely out of that mindset you were in. You're like, ah, oh, I got to put out this fire. And then you're like, screw this camera up. I'll, I'll do this another day. And then you just don't do it. It's tough. You don't. Man. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's, you hit it on the dot. Um, it's, it's really, uh, the, the thought of, I guess, kind of being too much in your head, uh, selfishly, honestly, I, I started this because I was just so uncomfortable and it sounds weird, but being in front of the camera, um, in, and not having, uh, the comfort of my lines, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, I know, like, even I know, like as an actor, you kind of have to know, like, okay, this is, this is everything. Like you're in this space, like 
you know, you have to know what you're communicating. Um, and, and so you kind of, you have in your head or, or at least in, in your mind about where this character is going and you're, you're, you, you have the words that you have kind of, and then you just kind of blurt everything out, you know? So it's like, I, I always say it's, it's, it's like you're, when you're on a film set as an actor, it's like, no one's really looking at you except maybe the director and a producer, you know? Um, but everyone else is looking at you objectively. So you have like, uh, you know, makeup person, makeup person's trying to like, you know, keep the makeup off your collar. And then the wardrobe person, that collar keeps flipping over. So the, they're all looking at these little things. Like the DP is like, oh God, how do we change that light? Keeps his head. So naturally when we're in front of a big, big group of people, you end up thinking like, oh, everyone's looking at me. Like they're, you know, everyone thinks I'm probably horrible. And some actors don't want to be looked at like big actors they do not want anyone looking at them except for the director. And, you know, for me, I, I, I realize that there's a practicality. Like no one's really looking at my performance. Like the, the, the sound guy, he's just concerned when I reach that peak and I keep blowing out the sound, you know, he just wants me to be at a consistent level. So it's really technical, but what I wanted to do selfishly getting back to it is be able to at least, talk and communicate like we are now mm -hmm. and not having to be so caught up in like, what am I thinking? What are we doing? Like what in my head, you know? Yeah, that's tough and, though. That's kind of a two way street. I and it's interesting that you say that about being on set because it's like filming a video for yourself, YouTube video or whatever is such a different animal. One, because a lot of times it's just you and the camera, like you can go hide away in your room and when there's no one else in the room, it's way easier to talk to the camera than if yep. there's other people around or even, you know, in the house, or whatever, you're like, I sound like an idiot. Like, you know, you have those weird, like internal battles with yourself. You're like, ah, I don't want these people hearing me record and messing them up and saying it again and all these things Then like, I've been through a thousand times now. I just don't really care, but yeah. it still messes with me a little bit. Uh, but like on, I, to me in my head, and this is, I think will be interesting to hear is like, a lot of those types of things of like what needs to be said, who's moving where, what the action is, you know, like that's almost predetermined by someone else. And you don't have to think through that or what the story is or all these things like you just I'm supposed to go from here to here and look angry at this guy and get in the car and leave. Like to me, that seems so much simpler than trying to come up with what you're going to say and what the story and what the hook is going to be and edit it and do it like it's so it's like predetermined by someone else for you. It's, that to me seems so yeah. much easier. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It really is. And I mean, you, it's not like you could just switch it up and be like, actually, we're going to go into that field over there. It's like, Oh no, you're not. We have this whole army of people lighting you and dressing you and making sure that you're, how many you know, people are on a, how many people are on a set to, typically? Um, it depends. So, uh, it, it depends on a few things. If we are doing like a big special effects thing, uh, you know, our, our makeup department increases, our wardrobe department increases. And then, you know, depending on the, the special effects, sometimes the stunt guy will be there. So it's really the stunts, uh, special effects. Anytime we're doing like the box cutter thing, I mean, that was like everything inflated. You know, we had a, a huge, the crew goes up because they're bringing in what you call day players, um, which are additional resources for hair, makeup, wardrobe. So the, the crew list jumps. But I would say, you know, it ranges somewhere between um, uh, maybe 90 to 150 people somewhere, Dang. you know. And you play, yeah. all, you do all your own stunts, right? You're your own stunt man. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do all my own stunts. I just I I always tell the uh, I always tell the um, there, there's a guy named El Godo and he's he's a great stunt guy and we always end up um, end up uh, working together and one year the year of box cutter I died like three times and he played he was my stunt guy in each death. And he's like, bro, you got to stop dying. I'm not going to have any work. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, just keep dying. And then you have a, a ton of work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That is so, so funny. Yeah. I was getting t uh, typecasted as the dead guy for a while. So, well, yeah, you're like the uh, drug dealing 
shooting dead guy. Like, jeez. <laughs> it's so funny. But it's what fun. Do, what it's have really, you had more fun, fun doing? Fun and... Have you had more fun doing Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul? Or do you have a favorite between the two and like which which show you like more? And do you watch them? Do you go back and like yeah, watch them with everyone yeah, I else? Try, I try to watch as many as I can. And um, I think Breaking Bad was kind of unprecedented. You know, anything that if you've already been through it, you know, there's kind of there's something about, you know, there's a familiarity and you kind of like in this sense, everyone is new. You know, now it's like everyone actually is old. Like we all have been together. <laughs> we're all 10 years older. And so we're all, you know, we're all old to each other. So it's kind of, um, you know, we get grumpy with each other sometimes. So we're like a family now at this point. So that's kind of nice. Um, which is irregular, you know, in film and television, it's kind of like we're in this weird, um, gypsy, uh, you, you know, like we're in the circus. And so you end up running across some people that you work with every once in a while. Um, but at the same time, it's really small. So you have pockets like in New York, um, you know, you have, you have different crew, of course, there and LA same. And then if you do a, um, a project that's more international or that's, then it's kind of a hodgepodge of people from different areas. So, but it's really, it, it's small and inclusive in a sense that you could start talking to someone and then you find out that, that person is dating, you know, uh, that they, they were dating your, the, the, one of the camera guys, um, or just, there's all these mixed just relationships. Weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, typical like, but, uh, small I'd community stuff just cause it was new. Right. You know, yeah. From that a little, sense, little bit yeah. more exciting. Yeah, yeah, brand new and exciting and unprecedented. I guess at that time there we really weren't at at that peak of where we are now, right? In terms of television, that's wild. What do we have forward to look to? Uh, look, how, what do we have to look forward to? Is what I was trying to say. <laughs> what we, um, is there any more Breaking Bad stuff coming? Uh, Breaking Bad, I don't think so. I mean, I think they kind of closed the lid on Breaking Bad. Um, uh, better call Saul. Um, but who knows? You never know with Vince. It's like, you know, uh, you never know with, well, him. it just takes a good idea better of like, Oh, I know how we can revive this. Right. Yeah. Kind of like, yeah, Oh, I know how we can that. keep this story yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. Cause was, ultimately was, that's what uh, it comes down to. Right. It's the storyline. Like how can we keep the story going? <laughs> yeah. Which is, and which is funny because it's like, it's 10 years later, but we're playing, um. Oh, what it what would it be? Six years prior right. to their Breaking Bad, so it's kind of becoming physically. Uh, it's getting harder, you know, as as we go on. Um, we all have to try to be as as young as we possibly can, uh, and defy nature. From yeah. That sense. Yeah. Has but, it um, has it been tough for a lot of the characters to like remain looking the same throughout all of this too? Um, I think more. Uh, you know, I think everyone's pretty healthy. Um, but on the side of, I think hair and makeup, you know, that's really up to hair and makeup, right? Like right. they're the ones, they're the geniuses that, that, that drop, you know, years off of us. And, uh, and in some cases, you know, drop pounds just in case, uh, we're not <laughs> consistently hitting the weight, uh, you know, not like there's a requirement or if it's just like, you know, who knows, like there was, uh, there's some characters that maybe, come from playing a character that's supposed to be 20 pounds heavier and now they're back on uh back on better call Saul where they were 20 pounds lighter and they're like a fighter like they're having to get back to their fighting weight right, you know right and make you know to make the character consistency yeah so yeah. um so but so we still some got some we still got some left for a better call Saul to come though right because he like in the most recent yeah, season, he's six. finally he's finally become Saul Goodman recently in this most recent se yeah. season. So I'm like, I have like I, I was so not caught up with Better Call Saul. I was like, I've just and I binged watched all of it. I think right around with all the COVID stuff, I was like, well, I'm home now for a while. Like, let's get caught up. I watched the Tiger nice. King. I, I got caught up on all the Better Call Saul, like all of it. Have you watched? Uh, have you seen Queen of the South? No. Yeah, that's a good. It's a good show. Is it? I, I'm not in it at all, but uh, you know. Oh, then I, I don't want to watch good it. Good work. It's, it's good. <laughs> good. I'll it's check really it out. Good. Cool. Yeah. 
Awesome, yeah. dude. Well, listen, I won't take up much more of your time. I really appreciate it. Is there anything else you want to share with my audience? Anything you want to tell them to go check out? Go check out. No, I mean, can I ask you some questions? Absolutely. I'm an open book. Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, okay. So first question, what's, what's back there? What is in that Pelican case? Uh, in the Pelican case right now, it's probably empty because it's probably hanging on the wall in my office. Oh, I can go okay. grab some guns. Though. You want to see something? It was probably the Ruger sure. Precision Rifle. Trav, why don't you go get that? Actually, go grab like anything you can grab. <laughs> He'll grab something you cool to see, look at. Do you want to see my new Archeon? Sure. Yeah, let me grab it. Let's see. Um, but this is this is my my EDC. Ooh, that's cool. EDC. Put that in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> if you're just listening to the podcast, it's like a giant things. axe. Oh, that's rad. Nice Damascus blade on that. Yeah, a little Damascus blade. And then for some reason, I have like uh, I have two different mags. I have like three hundred blackout mag and I have an AR. Yeah, mag those hex randomly. those hex mags are on cool. my desk here. So let me see. Oh no! All right, so this is the Ruger Precision Rifle that's usually that goes in that big Pelican case. Let me put the bipod down. This is a three hundred eight. Wow! This is like their performance long range chassis. Um, it's got a big Trejicon. What is this? I don't remember. Four to 16 scope. Um, and I have not shot this thing nearly enough, but it's super rad. That is bad. Yeah. And that's Ruger? Yeah, this is the Ruger precision rifle. And at the time, like this is one wow. of those like out of the box guns that's just, like a sub sub MOA at like a thousand yards or something. Like it's a highly accurate rifle right out of the box. Throw a scope on it, dial it in. And you're ready to go. That's like not a lot of upgrades to do to this for the for the average person. I'm sure if you're a yeah. precision shooter, you'd upgrade some things. But for somebody like me, like I can't shoot as good in, as this gun can shoot. So it's great for me. Yeah, that's awesome. And do you have do you you take it to the range? You have some thousand thousand yard plus targets. Uh, we've got a range here that goes 800 yards. So pretty close. Okay. Pretty close. Um, cool. Have you shot that far before? Eight hundred. Yeah. It's yeah, I have. Tough. Um, That's not easy. Yeah. 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 I think it was like with the Creedmoor round. Yeah, the six five uh, Creedmoor. They make this in the six yeah. five Creedmoor, and I opted not to do it because six five Creedmoor is like for a thousand yards plus or twelve hundred yards plus, and I didn't have anywhere to shoot it that far. It's yeah. It's more expensive to shoot. The ammo is hard to get. I was like. Just give me the yeah. 308, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's bad. That's a bad gun. Man. Yeah, it's super rad. That's this, a bad gun. This is a Frankenstein gun that I built. Um, it's got like some Wilson Combat stuff on it. It's got a, a Voltor billet upper. It's a PSA Afghanistan lower receiver. Um, Cerakoted cool. by my buddy Dave at Coastal Cerakotes. He's got our logo on it. I don't know how well you can see that or not. The logo's back here. That's bad. Um, but this is 300 blackout. Got a, got a suppressor for it and stuff. And um, it's really rad. I love this gun. Another good oh, one here man. is the HK MP5. Or this is the SP5, oh, yeah. SP5K technically. Um, that's the semi-automatic version and not fully automatic. So this is getting we ready. We were out shooting that gun uh a uh, surgeon friend of mine he he actually put the um what is it called the uh the trigger the uh oh that binary the trigger. binary trigger binary trigger yeah yeah where it yeah. shoots when you pull the trigger and it shoots when you release the trigger so it's like bop, bop, yeah. Bop, 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 bop. yeah super yeah 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 they're really, really yeah that cool. was it was so cool man we had a good time shooting that one definitely that's all he brought me to play with yeah. what else you got what other questions you. do you have so another question I have, um, I guess just as, as an entrepreneur, it's, it, you know, um, this is just something that I'm asking, I'm asking everyone is, you know, in terms of COVID just being prepared and, and not, um, uh, the, you know, there's nothing really that could prepare you for this time in this period, you know, yep. but, um, you know, if you were going to look back you know, for your business and, and, and plan a little differently, what, what would, what would that have been? What would that look like? 
I don't know that you can plan for it. I don't, you know, we, we did sort of plan for it. We saw this hit China months before it hit America in a, in, before it hit America in a big way. Right. Yeah. So when we saw some of those reports, because we deal with, with Asia manufacturing, you know, so, um, our stuff is made in Vietnam and we source some of the materials come from China. Um, but our main like operations out of Asia or in Hong Kong. And so we've had our eye on Hong Kong with all these like riots in China trying to take over Hong Kong and all this kind of stuff. We've been watching some of the news closely on that and just, you know, we got people there that we're looking after. And, um, you know, so we, we kind of saw, we saw this, this first wave of the, the coronavirus hit China and we were like, oh man, you know, like supply is going to be kind of interesting because we, again, we get some, some of our materials buckles and stuff like that come out of, out of China. So, but the good news was when some of that was hitting, it was also during Chinese New Year's, which is when all the factories are shut down anyways. And we had already planned for Chinese New Year and like, well, the factories are already going to be shut down. We're not going to get anything during this time anyway. So we were already like pretty well stocked up on inventory, knowing that we needed to get through Chinese New Year. It's just kind of how we, how we operate, right? Like, know that that's going to be a thing. So we just plan accordingly. So we were only affected by some stuff by two weeks and that wow and that was stuff that like we just like we need as soon as it fires back up we need to get this out and so we were only like two weeks of a delay on something we needed to come out of china which in the grand scheme of things is nothing like two weeks all right cool so we like we dodged that bullet like that's no big deal um and then when it really started to hit the u.s and they started doing all the travel bans and all this stuff and you know we're going to start doing quarantine at home and stay home for two weeks and that was what march i think and it was like oh shit like here this is the beginning of the end like that's it we're screwed you know like the whole world's going to shut down and like thank god we're in a good way financially and like we've got good inventory and you know we'll we'll just see what happens you know and um, we, my business partner, Alex is like unbelievably smart and he's like a super nerd with numbers. So he did, he did some stuff financially for us to just make sure that we were going to be good and that we weren't, um, that we were just had, you know, plenty of cash to get us through if we needed to. So that was really good. He kind of saw this coming. So he was like, so, you know, very on the front end of like making sure that some of the things that we could do even through the the PPP loans or, you know, um, payroll yeah. stuff and all those kinds of loans that were available to businesses. Like we were on the very front end of that. And, um, then sales, sales really kind of tanked for like a week in that initial week of everyone, like not going to work and everyone sort of just stopped doing anything except for buying toilet paper. Mm -hmm. Everyone was buying toilet paper. <laughs> you know and then and then it started to pick back up we were like oh sweet all right cool and then it kept going it kept going and we were setting like record numbers like all through the corona stuff and i was like this is crazy well the pro and then it, you know it turns out like a lot of online sales like no one could go to the stores anymore and there were still people working not yeah. everyone was out of work and people could per you know work from home perfectly fine so the people were still spending money and a lot of people still had in, you know, income to, to burn or we're still having babies that wasn't going to stop. And people, you know, now they're not having a baby shower and they can't go to it. So they're just mailing them a gift instead of a baby shower. So people keep having babies and we keep selling diaper bags and sales were up. And then it turned out we ended up burning through all of our inventory. We like started selling out of stuff and we couldn't get it fast. And it was just, so I couldn't have done anything else to prepare differently for it to answer your question. Um, aside from like forecasting that sales were going to be way up and we were going to sell more and I would have ordered more stuff, which, but I would never yeah, have known that. Which would be impossible. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Then you'd have a cash flow issue. Yeah. I mean, that right? seems to always be an issue with a business since when you're having to buy inventory like that. But yeah, but at any rate that I don't know that we could have planned. I don't know that I would have done anything different. Yeah. I don't like yeah. have any regrets or like, ah, oh, we should have done this or, yeah, we're yeah. super fortunate no, I hear for you. sure. I hear you. No, that's good. That's great. That's it's wonderful. It's cool to see certain businesses doing doing really well, and um, and I think people are having a, more of an appreciation for. I don't know. I guess you know, local business, small business. You know, being able to buy from, uh, you know, really unique items. I know I'm. I have more time, so I you know I'm able to look and and see. Um, 
you know, rather than just buying something from a site that I normally go to, it's, you know, now I can kind of research it a little bit more, see, find something yeah, a little something cooler. Really, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, definitely. And, um, and yeah, but on the business side, like for us, it was the same thing. We got through that, the PPP, uh, program and then, um, and then it kind of shifted, like, you know, I have a general contracting construction company. and um, What don't you do? Actually... You, got, you do it all. What's I'm saying? What don't you do? <laughs> oh, man. it's And thank God. I was just going to say thank God because the acting stuff is impossible right now. You know, so with the exception of residuals, which is kind of nice, um, and everyone's watching TV, so keep watching TV. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but you know with the exception of that it's like you know uh the the construction stuff is still deemed uh, essential work you know so um yeah. so it's been nice to be able to still have that as a function but honestly it's it, it, it it's hard not to start climbing the walls a little bit and yeah. uh, you know I, I used to travel a ton with the family and so uh it, you know now we we haven't been on a, a plane of course for you know four or five months. So mm -hmm. kind of crazy. Yeah. It's super crazy. You know, the only thing that I think, uh, now that going back to your question and running through my head of things that I would have changed and it's not so much on the business side, but on the home front with the kids and like they ended up being homeschooled, at, you know, for a while it was all this online virtual learning stuff and you're in zoom calls with your teachers and other kids in the class. And you know, like we, I don't think, I don't think most parents in America were ready for that. Like it takes a very, yeah dedicated and and certain i think type of person to be a teacher and i think it's gotten a lot of appreciation for teachers uh for sure um yeah and you know my wife is she was like i am not a teacher i am not good at this i don't want to be good at this you know but like you have to adapt and overcome and figure it out you know like you can't just you can't just keep your kid and stop the learning like and th now it's just continuing and we don't even know now if we're the kid, what the kids are doing with school in the upcoming school year that's supposed to start in the next like 30 days, you know? So it's like, what does that look like? So it's like crazy. So that's been wild. <laughs> and you know, you haven't had to deal with that. I, I guess, cause your daughter's so young, but, and I don't Not know, yet. and it's going to change. I think it's going to change the way, you know, schools operate f probably forever. Like I think there's going to be a lot more online learning for younger kids now a lot like colleges went to like online college plat you know route i think that we're going to start seeing more of that even in the elementary school uh ages uh so that's going to be interesting yeah. yeah i don't know man it's just a it's just a wild time and then you know with, and then everything else with all the, the the political stuff and you know all that's just crazy but it is i it's, can't it, even all of it like the timing of everything it's well like the, the yeah storm. and it's like you got the virus happening and then you've got the, the, it's an election year. So you've got the, the political stuff going on and then the racial yeah. movement going on and defund the police. I think they need to fund teachers. Like <laughs> everything's just crazy. <laughs> like just flip it all upside down. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, but I, I think from imagine being, well, I guess you can because you have, you have kids in school. But imagine learning American history like now, you know, now that there's like a microscope on it, now mm -hmm. that there's a microscope on, you know, the, the Constitution and rights and like, you know, due process. And, you know, you, you're going to have some amazingly smart kids, you know, considering, you know, all of this that's going on, um, they, they'll actually live through some of this and be able to be like, wow, this, that's, that's crazy. You know, I, I, I've, I experienced that, you know, mm -hmm. firsthand. I know what that looks like. Yeah. Hopefully those are, those martial are things. Law, you know, but yeah. like they'll, they're seeing things where they're like, okay, that that's, that's what this is. And there's a context to it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's pretty wild. And so I was trying I to put some of that in perspective for my kids, even with just with the coronavirus. I'm like, Hey, listen, like we need to, we're going to have to stay home. We can't go out. We're not going to restaurants. We're going to be at home for the next two weeks. Of course we thought it was just going to be two weeks in the beginning. And I was like, look, like this is, this is a pandemic. Like this is stuff that you're going to be telling your grandkids about. So like, this is a very big deal. And I need you guys yep. just to work, cooperate, work with mom and dad, like just do what we say to do or get everything, you know, two weeks will go by. But like, I want you guys to like soak it up and understand what's going on. It's a big deal. 
of course, it hasn't ended and they're just everyone's over it. And they're like, screw that pandemic. <laughs> but it's you're like you're like the flight attendants, like you're like the flight attendants and you have your passengers and you're like, just be calm. Like, we're <laughs> yeah. we're going to circle around the city one more time. Yeah. You know, don't worry. <laughs> you know, enjoy your beverage. What yeah. Would you like? Would yeah. You like get you another yeah. one. Jeez. Yeah. I have one more question. For yeah. You, yeah. Uh, your NSX. Yeah. Let's talk Man, about cars. Let's gotta, talk like, about cars. Okay, so let me put some context. Okay. Like, with, with seeing your NSX uh-huh. is like, you know, and I've, I, I like cars as well, but um, the NSX, that was like the first sports car I remember that I was really into mm-hmm. as a kid. You know, I remember, you know, when the NSX was, was out, that was like... Yeah, that was it. The holy grail. Like that was the poster car. Yeah, yeah. Like it was in your bedroom. Like I'm going to have that car. Like that was me. Same thing, man. There's, there's a handful of those things for a lot of us, right? You got like yep. the Dodge Vipers and the, you know, you got the Lamborghini that everyone looked at. That's like the stuff you got at the Scholastic Book Fair that was like the poster you got, you know, at school. But, um, but yeah, same, same man, the NSX. I love it. Uh, that's awesome, man. That's great. What what's the other uh, what's the other dream car? Um I don't know to be honest with you. That to me is like my holy grail car. Like there's other cars I'd love to have, but like that one just like yeah. was a bucket list car that I sh- yeah. wish I would have bought years ago. So for some context, and I don't know how much you know about me personally outside of the business. I know you follow stuff, but like, you know, I used to build custom cars. So I come from an automotive background and I did, I used to do a lot of like import tuner, you know, builds and and turbo stuff and things like that. So like I I was always into like the Japanese stuff and I built an NSX for a customer years ago that just, I was like, I'm recreating this car for myself when I can afford it. And it was like unbelievable. I was like, I have to do this. And then uh, the NSX, the value of the NSX wasn't as crazy just after that. And I was like, oh, I could get a used one for like, you know, 20 grand. And I was like, man, I wish, and I was like poor at the time. You know, I was like, I can't, I can't afford to spend 20 grand on just a car to play with. And uh, I can barely even put gas in my truck right now, you know? So like, that's where I was on life at the time. So I was like, ah, oh, when I can get one, like, thankfully they're, av- they're affordable now. Well then, then the new NSX came out and the old ones just skyrocketed in value. I was like, now, you know, oh. I was like, now these things are like 100 grand, 120 grand, 70 grand, 200 grand. I'm like, I'm never going to own one. You know, I was like pissed. And then an opportunity came up where I found a smoking deal on one that like needed a little bit of work. And I was like, perfect. That's the one. Like, I don't care that it's, you know, got these things like I can fix that stuff. Like, that's what I do. And uh, so it was just like perfect timing to be able to afford one that that wasn't 200 grand or 150 grand and be able to like do the work, which I wanted to do anyways. Like I like I've got a whole car shop out here where I can still mess with stuff and work on cars. And, you know, it's kind of like gets me out of my head where I just like I need to turn off everything else and just do something and escape from reality. Like I'll come in on a Saturday and work on the car or something. So anyways, when you uh, when you come down, we're going to go shoot some guns. We're going to go play around in the NSX. And we'll probably drink some beer and, and eat a lot of food. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, the new Broncos came out. And that, yeah, you excited uh, about that? We've been, yeah, I've been we've been looking at those. Those are uh, they look really cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Got a guy that was in. Um, I, I used to share an office garage, and he had uh, an old uh, the old Bronco, uh-huh. and then he had uh, an older Defender. I used to. Build. And he had a few other vehicles. Yeah, but like. You know, he had those parked, and I would just always, you know, I was, became a big fan at that time. Yeah, so. yeah, the defenders are cool. I used to build a lot of defenders, a lot of high end ones for like a lot of a lot of big names. So that was that's awesome. That was man. my business for a while. That's cool. Yeah, they're really cool. But yeah, definitely down. Um, my uh, my um, in laws live in the south, so oh cool, we'll, they moved down there, so we'll have to uh, be out there for sure sometime soon. Definitely cool, man. Yeah. Thank you so much once again for for coming on and hanging out and, and talking to us about all the stuff. I I appreciate it, uh, and I'm looking forward to to getting together some more. And I you know I really yeah. appreciate you sending me all the like meth and all the other stuff in the mail. I... <laughs> <laughs> Send all the meth. Yeah, yeah. There it's you rock go. candy. It's rock candy. There you go. That's, that's that was fifteen to twenty five right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> 
That's it. That's it for me, man. <laughs> yeah. Hey, remember that guy we used to talk to, Jeremiah? Oh, yeah, he got locked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I got locked up after I put him out for all the, the meth that he sends through the mail. Uh, yeah, actually, it's it's the funny last thing is on the before we leave. Um, it's actually candy. If you, you haven't eaten it yet. Yeah, yeah, um, it's rotten candy. And yes. we used to we used to eat it on set. And so Aaron Paul and I would be sitting there talking and just eating the stuff. And then, you know, when you're when you're an actor, you set all the bad habits on set. So then. We had other crew coming by and taking scoops like, oh, man, you know, it was great. And putting it like, you know, in their gear or whatever and just munching on it. And then we'd keep knocking the scale off because they wanted it to. So they would like have a real life. Uh, it would have to make a real life weight. Yeah. So they'd have to keep telling us, guys, hey, quit come eating on, it. stop eating all the. Stop eating all the meth. You're messing up <laughs> our, uh, our scale here. That's so funny. So is that what you guys used in the show then? Was it rock candy as a prop? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. The same stuff I send you is what we is what we used. Got it. That's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, and I appreciate that. You continue to send us stuff and the letters and the and the, the, the patches and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll we'll send you some so you can uh, sell them on your site. There you as go. Well. Yeah. The patches for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Can people listening, can they go uh, buy that anywhere from you currently or no? Yeah, they're on our, so breaking, breaking dad TV.com. It's on our site. Actually, okay. hold on. Let me just, well, we're, I don't want to give you the wrong, I guess you could pop it up and post, right? But um, breaking dad. Okay. So it's breaking dad dot TV. Got it. Is the website. Cool. Yeah, not breaking dad uh, to get that right. So yeah, get your that's shit our together. website and you can purchase it. Yeah. <laughs> and tactical baby gear. So yeah. Come. Yeah. 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 We'll get that set up for sure. I'll be happy to sell those. Awesome. Dude. Thanks again so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for everyone that's listening. Uh, make sure you like comment, subscribe, leave ratings, reviews, all the things, and we'll see you on the next episode. Peace. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Shout out to tactical baby gear and uh, you guys keep doing your thing.